Hello there, and welcome to your first lecture in Econ 261. Now, the bulk of this class is devoted to figuring out what to do with data once it's collected, but first we have to start with understanding the different types of data and how researchers gather samples from populations. So this lecture is really just devoted to understanding the difference between a sample and a population, and then some commonly used strategies for getting a sample from a population. So let's start with the two major sources of data. Most broadly speaking, you can have data that comes from a population, and it's called a census, or data that comes from a sample that's called sample data. Now, data that's coming from a population means that you have all the information from everybody or everything that you are interested in examining or that you're interested in answering questions about. So you could have all people, events, or items of interest captured in your data. That would be a population. But as you can imagine, most times you're not going to have access to every single thing that you're interested in studying or answering questions about. So in most cases, researchers are examining a sample to answer questions about a population. And a sample is just a subset of that population who are really supposed to represent the characteristics of the original population of interest. So instead of, in my case as an IO psychologist, I'm interested in employee behaviors, attitudes, perceptions. So I'm never going to have the opportunity to study all employees. So in all the research I've done, I have looked at a subset of all employees, either from one organization or from multiple organizations. I've studied them and then I've used that data to make inferences or assumptions about all employees. So a sample is a subset of the population that's studied to un better understand the original population that the researcher didn't have access to. So you can see in this illustration at the bottom of your slide there, the population would be the entire alphabet, and then a sample would just be a few letters from that alphabet that I would study, examine, see what's happening there, and then try to make assumptions about the original population. Now, just for logistical concerns for the rest of the semester, keep in mind that the numerical description of a population, which is typically an average or what we'll call a mean, any numerical description of a population would be a parameter. So like the average age among all Americans, if Americans were the only people I was interested in studying, that would be a parameter. Also, if I am displaying the size of a population, the statistical notation for the size of a population is an uppercase N. Now for a sample, if I'm referring to a numerical description of a sample characteristic, so like the average age of NSC students in America, if I was interested in looking at the average age of all Americans, only had access to NSC students, that would be my sample, kind of a poor representation, but a sample nonetheless, the average age in that sample would be called a statistic. And the size of that sample, the statistical notation for that is a lowercase n. So if there were 3,000 NSC students that I examined, my lowercase n would be n equals 3,000. So I'm going to go through some of the most common sampling techniques or ways to collect data from a sample and different methods of outreach for getting access to your sample. And I'm going to start with the most basic and go into the most complex. So convenient sampling is very basic and it's essentially the researcher just studies whatever they can get their hands on. So getting access to who or whatever is available to them. Now in the context of human subjects research, convenient sampling is very, very common because it's difficult to get access to a big, huge group of people, especially if you're studying people across different regions. Also, there are a lot of ethical constraints in place for human subjects research that require you to rely on voluntary participation in most cases. So nearly all human subjects research in behavioral sciences especially are based on convenience sampling. However, it can be a really effective way to make inferences about the population if you have multiple studies that start to show a similar pattern of results, even if convenient sampling is used. Now, I want you to take a look at this flyer here and think about some of the challenges with convenient sampling. 
So this is a flyer from a study that was taking place at Nevada State College. And the researcher wanted people to wear a miniature camera around their neck that took pictures every 30 seconds. And then they would come into the lab after wearing that camera for a day and they would download their pictures and answer various sets of questions. And the research team wanted to see the relationships between those questions and see how those were predicted by the pictures that were taken by the, the, the camera that the, the uh, participant wore. So they heavily relied on this advertisement to recruit participants. So this was posted in various classes and throughout campus to get people to contact the research lab and come in and participate in the study. Now think about the challenges associated with that type of sample if the researcher wanted to study the population at large. So if wanted to study relationships among all people. Well, we're only looking at college students, so they may be inherently different from the population at large. Also, you're heavily relying on people who would volunteer to participate in a study like this. So if you're measuring personality, for instance, it may be that some people that volunteer have an inherently different personality from those who didn't volunteer. Also, if uh, professors are offering extra credit for students to participate, those who participate may be really needing those extra points or may have the extra time to participate in the first place, and that could set them apart from those who, again, chose not to participate. So you may not be confident that the people who participated in this study represent everybody that you're interested in studying. However, I'm not criticizing this strategy at all because it's pretty much what everybody has to use because that is the nature of human subjects research. Now, in a business context, when you have access to different types of data that are easier to collect and don't involve human subjects, you don't always encounter so many of these challenges. And we'll talk about some of those strategies next. So now I wanna talk about simple random sampling or probability sampling. Now, simple random sampling is classified as a type of sampling strategy where there is a calculable probability of being selected. And you're making your selections for your sample randomly from the entire population of interest. So with simple random sampling, everybody or everything has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. And this sample st sampling strategy is, at, strategy is advantageous because it is pretty representative. If you're randomly selecting people from the population and you're not relying on convenience, you're probably going to have a sample that reflects the characteristics of the population. But however, keep in mind, oftentimes it's difficult to have access to the entire population. So random sampling isn't entirely that common. However, there's two different types of random sampling. One is random sampling without replacement and the other is random sampling with replacement. So with random sampling without replacement, the selection is made and then it's not put back into the population before the next selection is made. So if you think about bingo, for instance, bingo, there's only one of each letter and number combination available for selection and each can only be selected once. It's not replaced. So someone randomly draws B50, they're not going to put that back in. It's been drawn already. It's not going to be replaced. So with random sampling without replacement, there's an inconsistent probability from one selection to the next, because if you start off with a pool of 100 and then you make a selection, now you have a pool of 99. You make another selection, now you have a pool of 98. So the pool in the population, the number of items or people in the population is diminishing with each selection, so the probability changes for each selection. And I'll demonstrate that here in a minute. Now, random sampling with replacement is when a selection is randomly made, then it's put back into the population before the next selection is drawn for the sample. So the probability of selection does not change with each selection because for each selection you're drawing from a constant number of things or people in your population. So an easy example of random sampling with replacement would be like rolling dice. So if you roll a d20, there's 20 sides, one through 20, and let's say you get a 20. Well, the probability of that happening is a 5% chance or a probability of 0.05. If you roll that dice again, the probability of getting a 20 is still a 5% chance because those numbers aren't being taken off the dice with each roll. So that would be an example of random sampling with replacement where the probability does not change from one selection to the next. Now let's use our little population down here as an example. So let's say that these little people at the bottom represent a population of 12. And let's say that I am doing random sampling without replacement. So let's say I make my first selection and I get this green three right here. Well, the probability of that person being selected on that trial was a one in 12 
or an 8.3% chance. Well, that person is gone now, right? I'm not replacing them, they're out of my population. So now I make another random selection and let's say I end up with this blue 10 here. Well, the probability of being selected for that trial is one out of 11 because that green three is gone and now my probability is 9.1% chance of being selected. Now, if I make another selection, that person is gone, right? So now I'm drawing from 10 in my population and let's say I get this red seven. Well, the probability of that selection was one in 10 or 10%. So you can see when you're doing random selection without replacement, the probability changes for each selection. Now let's do an example of random sampling with replacement. So if I say, okay, I've got my random sample, I'm gonna randomly select this person, my green three. Well, the probability of being selected was a one in 12 chance or 8.3%. Now I make my next selection, but I replace that green three. I don't take them out. I make another selection, Let's say I get the red eight. Well, the probability of that selection is also one in 12, just like the first one, or an 8.3% chance. Because again, I'm um, making selections from a consistently sized population. So it's important to note that random sampling with replacement is the gold standard in statistics. And a lot of the statistical analyses that we're using this semester rely on that assumption. But we're doing that just to keep it simple. In the real world, there's tons and tons of situations where you don't have random sampling with replacement and there's small statistical corrections to make up for that. Finally, stratified random sampling refers to random sampling within multiple homogeneous or similar groups that are referred to as strata. So the process of stratified random sampling starts with separating the population into non-overlapping groups or strata based on some variable of interest. So for instance, college major or ethnicity or sex. The next step after you separate the population into those non-overlapping groups is to decide how many individuals will be sampled from each group. And typically the number sampled from each group reflects the relative size of each group in the population of interest. So for example, if 50% of the population is red and 25% of the population is blue and 25% of the population is green, you'd want to have a sample that reflects those proportions. So if you took a sample of four, you would want to randomly select two from the red group or 50% from the red group, and then 25% or one from the blue group and randomly select one from the green group. So you would see that in the population, the proportions match the sample in terms of those grouping characteristics that you're interested in. Then you would randomly select the determined number of individuals from each group, and then you would combine that sample and start your research. So this is a strategic sampling strategy that is really geared toward ensuring all groups of interest, even the small ones, are included in your sample. And it allows you to do this without relying on chance and a huge sample to improve chances of a representative sample. Think about it, if you're just randomly plucking from the population, you're not going to guarantee that you're adequately representing or sampling all the groups that you're interested in sampling. So researchers typically use stratified random sampling when there's some sort of grouping variable that may have an impact on their results and when these groups within the population are small. So for example, if you wanted to study harassment and discrimination experiences among NSC students, you would expect to see differences in experience based on race and ethnicity. And you would need to make sure that you collect data from all racial and ethnic groups. So you can see the racial and ethnic composition of NSC right there on the slide. Um, this is taken right from the NSC website. Um, and you can see that some groups are much larger than others. So you would want to strategically sample within each ethnic or racial group to make sure that everybody is included in your sample. And you could also make sure that the ethnic composition of the sample reflects the population and is more representative. So you would want to have 44% of the people in your sample be white, 23% Hispanic, 11% black, 10% Asian, and so on. So stratified random sampling is a great strategy for getting a representative sample that reflects your population. 
but the strategy requires access to the population and prior knowledge of how grouping may have an impact on results. So it's difficult and rare in human subjects research. However, stratified random sampling is pretty easy when you have access to the population and you need to study a sample to save time, money, and resources. So as a psychologist and a person in general, and knowing that people are watching this lecture, I think that a lot of us are inherently interested in studying people and understanding how human subjects research works, especially in the business context. So it's really important to note that typically in human subjects research, you may start off with a random sample, but you almost never, ever, ever end up with one. So even if you start off with a beautiful random sample and you feel really confident that the people that you have access to represent the population, there's ethics involved with human subjects research. So even if you reach out to this random sample, they don't have to participate in your research. You have to rely on voluntary participation. So if you look at this illustration, you start off with the entire population of interest. So for example, your whole entire customer base. And let's say that you randomly select a group of customers to become your sampling frame. So the group of customers that you have the ability to contact with your survey. So now you're feeling pretty good about your sample if it was random, but then you have a situation where certain people from that sampling frame are not going to participate in your survey. So then you're left with just the sample of people who actually participated, who took the time to do it. And those customers may be very different from the customers that refuse to participate. So you're really not getting accurate results because you're not sure if the results from your study are going to reflect all of your customers, including those who have the personality type or the obligations in their life that kept them from participating in your study. So again, even if you start off with a random sample, typically in human subjects research, you pretty much end up with a convenient sample of people who took the time to participate in your study.